Well, I did. I listened, and then I tried to fix it. Why are men always trying to fix things? If I thought it could be fixed, I'd fix it. I, I was just letting off some steam. I wasn't sending out the bat signal for you to put on your cape, fly into town, and fix all my problems. Actually, Batman can't fly. Testing, one, two, three, testing. You're not getting it? Yeah, the mics are working though, so it's this, this one actually is the only one that works. Testing? Testing? Are you testing? 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 Testing?
One, two, one, two, mic check, one, two. You can hear? Okay.
Good afternoon. The Subcommittee on the Federal Workforce, Postal Service, and the District of Columbia hearing will now come to order. I want to welcome our ranking member, Mr. Chaffetz, and members of the Subcommittee, all of our hearing witnesses, and all those in attendance. The purpose of today's hearing is to examine H.R. 4735, a bill to amend Title V of the United States Code to provide that persons having seriously delinquent tax debts shall be ineligible for federal employment. The Chair, the Ranking Member, and the Subcommittee members will each have five minutes to make opening statements, and all members will have three days to submit statements for the record. Again, may I thank you for all, all for being here. Uh, the Subcommittee convenes today to examine and discuss H.R. 4735, which was introduced by my friend, the Subcommittee's Ranking Member, Representative Jason Chaffetz, on March 3, 2010. In short, H.R. 4735 prohibits individuals who have a lien placed against their property by the IRS from being hired for federal civilian service and also requires any federal employee subject to an IRS lien to be immediately terminated from employment. While the equitable and robust enforcement of our tax laws is commendable, there are serious weaknesses in H.R. 4735 which call its objective and its efficacy into question. Under current executive branch regulations on standards of ethical conduct for employees, the Office of Government Ethics requires that federal workers, quote, satisfy in good faith their obligation as citizens, including all just financial obligations, especially those such as federal, state, or local taxes that are imposed by law. In short, in short this means that a condition of employment, there exists an expectation and a requirement that federal employees demonstrate the highest degree of integrity in tax matters by both filing as well as paying their tax obligations. In furtherance of this policy, there are currently enhanced statutory provisions to allow the IRS to garnish wages of federal employees at rates of recoupment that are in excess of those required of non-government workers. While the U.S. tax code may be complex, the weaknesses of H.R. 4375 are not. Uh, simply stated, H.R. 4735 defines the offending status as, quote, a seriously delinquent tax debt as the existence of a lien against that employee's property. Pursuant to H.R. 4735, the existence of an IRS lien amounts to a legal fact requiring termination or prohibition of hiring and against which no rights of due process exist to challenge the validity or the amount of that lien before an impartial third party. Of course, it may be argued that the federal employee may challenge the validity and the amount of the lien from her place in the unemployment line after her termination if she has sufficient resources to do so. However, the unemployed federal worker is put at a marked disadvantage and has far less opportunity to challenge the IRS decision than is afforded to the individual taxpayers generally. Moreover, if it is indeed the objective of this legislation to recoup taxes owed by federal employees, one may reasonably ask, would it not be easier and more profitable to attach and garnish the wages of an employee who works for the federal government than to terminate him or her? Lastly, while H.R. 4735 exempts military personnel who owe the largest amounts of tax delinquencies, it ignores the fact that there are thousands of State Department, Treasury Department, Department of Agriculture, Drug Enforcement Administration, FBI, CIA, and Department of Justice employees who are also serving in hardship assignments who could be subject to termination under this bill. Just as with our military families, those civilian federal assignments have put extreme financial pressure on these workers and their families. While I understand and in some ways agree with the gentleman's interest in promoting the importance of tax compliance, I simply find myself unable to support the approach he is suggesting as outlined in H.R. 4735. In fact, the measure, if enacted as written, might actually diminish the likelihood that the IRS will recoup any taxes, excuse me, tax debt by leaving the delinquent taxpayer unemployed and therefore unable to generate any income to satisfy the debt through an installment program or a federal levy. In closing, it is my hope that these issues and questions concerning the IRS's collection procedures and potential costs and impact of H.R. 4735 will be elaborated on further by today's witnesses. To that end, I thank each of you for joining us today, and I look forward to your testimony. I will now recognize our ranking member and the sponsor of H.R. 4735, the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chaffetz, for five minutes. 
Uh, top of the morning to you, Chairman, and thank you for uh, holding this uh, hearing in such a timely uh, manner. I, I do truly appreciate it. I would like uh, to ask unanimous consent to enter three documents uh, into the record. Um, one is the so-called uh, FERTI report, the Federal Employee Retiree Delinquency Initiative, as well as the TIGDA, Treasury Inspector General of Tax Administration uh, document, as well as President Obama's uh, remarks regarding uh, uh, paying of taxes for uh, contractors that was made on January 20th of this year. Hearing no objection, uh, those records, uh, records are entered into the record. Thank you. I'd also like to note for the record that uh, Mr. Christopher Rizek uh, of Kaplan and Drysdale is uh, one of our witnesses today. Today is the first time that I've met Mr. Rizek, but it should be noted that my uh, campaign has used Kaplan Drysdale for some minor uh, campaign uh, issues. Uh, I've had no interaction, uh, nor did I have any interaction in the selection of this witness, but I do think it's uh, proper to note that for the record. We will not hold it against him. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, at, at the heart of this, is, uh, of this matter is an issue of fairness. And I happen to concur 100 percent with President Obama. And I'm going to read a, 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 a few comments uh, that he made on January 20th on uh, signing of the memorandum blocking tax delinquent applications, uh, applicants from obtaining government contracts. Uh, from President Obama, quote, all across this country there are people who meet their obligations each and every day. You do your jobs, you support your families, you pay your taxes you owe because it's a fundamental responsibility of citizenship. And yet somehow it's become standard practice in Washington to give contracts to companies that don't pay their taxes. Further, he went on to say, quote, the status quo then is inefficient and it's wasteful. But the larger and more fundamental point is that it's wrong. It is simply wrong for companies to, tax, to take taxpayer dollars and not be taxpayers themselves. So we need to insist on the same sense of responsibility in Washington that so many of you strive to uphold in your own lives, in your own families, in your own business. That principle is true for contractors, and I think that same principle should be true for federal employees. The language that, is in with it, that has been presented in this document, in much was lifted, if you will, or patterned after H.R. 572 which I have asked to be uh, joined on as a co-sponsor. Uh, I think it's a good piece of legislation. I'm proud to be a Republican uh, joining on as a co-sponsor of this uh, uh, Democratic initiative. I think it's right. I support it, and I think we should hope and expect that it would pass. My simple point that I'm trying to make is that the same principle for contractors should be true for federal employees. Now, the overwhelming majority of federal employees do the right thing. They pay their taxes. They work hard. They contribute to the good of the United States of America. But we have a few bad apples. And as lawmakers, we have a duty and responsibility to hold them to a high standard. Many would argue, including me, we should hold them to a little bit higher standard. If you are going to have the privilege of working for the United States of America, I think you have a duty and obligation to pay your taxes. Now, if somebody is trying to do the right thing, the intention is not to just simply lop off their head and ruin their lives. There are two fundamental and distinct outs, if you will, in this bill that I do take issue with what has been said previously and characterizations of this, of this uh, bill I think are, are inaccurate. There are exceptions to when you would be terminated. Number one, a debt that is being paid in a timely manner pursuant to an agreement. So if you're, in, you're, you're trying to dig out from under a rock, you're trying to make good, if you're trying to actually do the right thing and you're, you're on a payment plan, you're trying, of course it would not be in the best interest of the United States of America or for that person individually for them to be fired. So if you're doing the right thing and you're trying to pay your obligation, and you've got a payment plan in place, there is no reason to terminate uh, that employment. The second part is a debt with respect to which a collection due process hearing is requested or pending. There's some language in between there. But if you have a request for a hearing, or if you have a hearing pending, again, under this law, under this bill, there would be no reason and no way for your, con for your employment to be terminated. I think that's fair. I am obviously very open to suggestions. But Mr. Chairman, at the core of what I'm trying to convey here is that it is a principle that the, the President has articulated. 
I agree with. Most people are not going to be affected by this. If you pay your taxes, there won't be a problem. But if you're a federal employee and you're not paying your taxes and you're not on a plan to do so, then I think you should be fired. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think we have more to be thankful today than you, to you today than you call this hearing, given, given um, the markup mark out, out of which this hearing uh, developed. I want to say uh, happy Saint, thanks uh, St. Patrick's Day to, to all. I claim admission, not necessarily by heritage. But I got a son born on St. Patrick's Day. One up that, if you will. <laughs> um, when we agree on basic principles, that ought to be the first thing we say. And I believe that the overriding principle uh, at the markup that all agreed upon was that if you are getting paid out of a pot uh, of the taxpayers, you ought to pay in to your taxes. Nobody likes to pay taxes, but there's something very one-sided about depending on the taxpayers of the United States and uh, being unwilling to do your share. With that understanding, we quickly found ourselves plunged into factors about which there was no information. Um, to be sure, who could disagree that, uh, depending on the circumstances, and by the way, there was very little information on what kind of circumstances should obtain, but depending on the circumstances, everybody who works for the federal government gets paid out of that pot and should have paid the taxes before dipping into that pot for your own wages. But it was Chairman Lynch who in, had done so much homework that he saved us from the law of unintended consequences. Uh, we were uh, put to the test of whether we should vote for a bill where a hearing had been proved necessary by the abundance of questions coming uh, from members of the committee. I was particularly concerned because we were dealing with two rarefied sections of, law, of federal law. One is the unendingly complex and specialized uh, civil service law that is, um, that is administered by OPM. And the other is an even more specialized set of law and regulations, and that, that's the tax code itself. So anybody who wants to jump off the cliff without a hearing on what's going to happen to somebody, whether he keeps his job or not, without knowing the consequences in both those sets of law is, it seems to me, immediately engaged in a, um, in a, um, a project that could result in unfairness that uh, he never intended. The least we can do when there are questions raised that were as abundant and as meritorious as the questions that obtained on that day just uh, perhaps two weeks ago is to do with the chairman who was perhaps chiefly instrumental in laying on the table uh, some of what uh, many of us did not know. Let's settle those matters. This is not something that uh, will bury the country if we have a hearing first. Here we were calling upon our own side to have a hearing in our own subcommittee. What could be more to our advantage than that, and I'm very pleased that Mr. Um, Chaffetz, who raised the issue for contractors, uh, those who raised the issue for federal employees, uh, are now able so quickly after those questions came to the fore to have a hearing which I believe will satisfy all concern. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, again, particularly for your interventions at the time of the markup. I thank the gentlelady. The chair now recognizes the ranking member for the full committee. Mr. Issa for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this important hearing. I might note that this hearing today is on H.R. 4735. Uh, since it wasn't noticed that way, I would like to suggest that we hold a similar hearing on H.R. 572. As the Chairman may know, H.R. 572, the bill that prompted this, never had a hearing. One of the challenges I think that uh, 
the chairman and myself as ranking member faced in the markup was that we had not vetted many of the issues that were brought up related, particularly by the majority, related to the federal employees. The amazing thing, of course, is every time somebody on either side of the aisle says federal worker, we immediately realize that what is good for the goose is good for the gander. A federal worker and a federal contractor have many similarities. Since I served on the House Select Intelligence Committee, I was very exposed to the fact that we have a huge amount of what are contract status employees in the clandestine world, but they're really a company of one. And under the uh, HR uh, 572, they would find themselves, if you will, if you were a CIA contractor of one, you would find yourself fired over without protection under H.R. Uh, uh, 572, you'd find yourself fired without protection on exactly what uh, the gentlelady from the District of Columbia and others have said we want to have as protections not currently in this bill. So, Mr. Chairman, I hope today as we go through this hearing that all of us will have both sides of our brain on, the one that says contractor and the one that says person because ultimately a great many of our contractors are either individuals or very small groups who enjoy all the same problems and burdens uh, that our employees, uh, as federal uh, employees have. Additionally, as was noted in the uh, markup, federal workers most often run into tax problems because they have small businesses or a family who has small business or some, something outside of their direct federal employment. I believe that if we, on a bipartisan basis, work together here at the subcommittee and then at the full committee, we can find a harmonized bill, one that provides appropriately near or absolute protections for the contractor, re thinking in terms often of a contractor of one, and for the, the private person. The due process that we ask for a federal worker to have is very appropriate and making sure that we do never have a situation in which a person finds themselves willing to catch up over time on their taxes uh, on a voluntary uh, or an agreed basis but at the same time wanting the opportunity to dispute taxes they believe they do not owe and to have all of the normal due process while still enjoying a paycheck. So I would join with the gentlelady from the District of Columbia and say when we leave this, we have to leave understanding that a large company or a small company that has a dispute with uh, the IRS should not find themselves out of a contract and thus unable to afford their own defense. Well, in fact, if they're given the opportunity to go through the process, they may well be vindicated. Certainly for a private individual who is a federal employee, the same is true and probably more obvious. So. As we go through the hearing today, which I appreciate us having, hopefully we're looking in terms of harmonization of two sets of federal workers, the individual federal worker and the federal worker under contract. And although they are hugely different in many ways, they are, from a standpoint of not paying their taxes, ultimately the same. They can only pay their taxes if they have income. We only want to make sure that they are in the process of leading to paying their fair taxes. And as long as they are, I would assume that the chairman and myself are in total agreement. We would want them to continue being vendors or employees of the federal government as long as, in fact, they are making a good faith effort to, re to either pay their taxes or to dispute them, as all of us have a right to do. I thank the gentleman. Yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, what I would like to do is, uh, it is the custom of this uh, subcommittee to swear all witnesses who are to offer testimony. Uh, so, Ms. Tucker, could I ask you to please rise and raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? The record will indicate that the witness has answered in the affirmative. I would like to just offer a brief introduction uh, of Ms. Tucker. Ms. Beth Tucker is currently the Wage and Investment Deputy Commissioner for Support for the Internal Revenue Service. In this position, Ms. Tucker has oversight over all wage and investment support organizations, including electronic tax administration and refundable credits, strategy and finance, business modernization, communications liaison, and equal employment opportunity and diversity. Uh, welcome, Ms. Tucker. Uh, I'd like to 
offer you the opportunity to uh, submit an opening statement for five minutes. Could you please uh, pull that microphone very close to you? It doesn't work very well. Let's just see if it's on. I'm not sure. I think that's better. There you go. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, Chairman Lynch, Ranking Member Shafitz, and members of the subcommittee, I'm pleased to appear before you this afternoon to discuss the IRS collection procedures as they relate to federal employees. Today's hearing was called to examine H.R. 4735 that would make persons with seriously delinquent tax steps ineligible for federal, federal employment. However, I'm not here to comment on that legislation, but rather to discuss our tax collection process. Mr. Chairman, the collection process is the same for all individuals. There are no special rules for federal employees. If a taxpayer does not respond to the first or subsequent IRS notices of late payment, the account becomes delinquent and the IRS will try to resolve the issue with the taxpayer over the telephone or in person. There are a number of payment options for those who cannot pay their taxes on time such as extension of time to pay, installment agreements, or offer and compromise. If a delinquent taxpayer does not cooperate, then the IRS may take enforced collection action. Enforcement action can include serving a notice of levy to attach taxpayers' income or assets, such as bank accounts. A levy is a legal seizure of the taxpayer's property to satisfy a tax debt, and in some cases can include the seizure and sale of real or personal property. The IRS may also file a notice of federal tax lien to secure the government's interest in the property the taxpayer owns while establishing priority as a creditor. However, as discussed in greater detail in my written testimony, IRS seeks to provide the taxpayer an opportunity to pay the tax debt voluntarily, making arrangements to pay or supply information to show that the payment would create a hardship. Enforced collection actions are taken only after repeated attempts to contact the taxpayer. The taxpayer can also request a hearing with our Office of Appeals and has the right to appeal certain other collection actions. The Federal Employee Retiree Delinquency Initiative, also known as FERTI, promotes federal tax compliance among current and retired federal employees. Each year, the IRS sends letters to the human capital offices of federal civilian agencies and departments participating in the data matching program to provide current information on previous year's delinquency rates and request the agency's support in promoting tax compliance within their workforce. The letters also raise awareness about the importance of timely and accurate returns, reporting all income, having the proper amount withheld, providing all required information, and good record keeping. The IRS is also providing federal agencies the tools they need to communicate with their workforces about the importance of tax compliance. We have drafted generic materials for all agencies and at the request of HUD just this year, tailored them to those employees struggling to pay their taxes. We've also provided links to IRS communication products, YouTube videos, public service announcements that HUD can use to communicate with their employees on the internet and through their own internal communication venues. The IRS has also made these outreach and education materials accessible to a broader audience and is sharing them with 90 other federal agencies. We will begin a more comprehensive and aggressive outreach campaign this fall based on the lessons we've learned this year. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. We believe that IRS rules and procedures, along with the current tax law and regulations, allow for federal employees to rectify their tax obligations. I'd now be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Uh, just for the record, I'd like to uh, get an honest consent to uh, submit into the record the uh, National Taxpayer Advocate 2009 Annual Report. It, it reads 2009 Annual Report, but it, it's actually submitted uh, December of uh, 2009, so it's a fairly recent report. Uh, Ms. Tucker, uh, according to the National Taxpayer Advocate, uh, they, they list serious problems with, with the IRS in terms of the taxpayer's position. And it is not, not meant to be critical of you. It's just red flags that the National Taxpayer Advocate raises. Uh, the most serious problem 
that they cite is the sheer complexity, as, as uh, uh, the gentleman from California uh, remarked, the sheer complexity of the tax code and, uh, the, and the number of uh, disputes and uh, difficulties that taxpayers have in, uh, in just complying. Uh, the second uh, most serious issue that they raise here in the National Taxpayer Advocate is the fact that uh, is the fact of automatic liens, automatic liens against taxpayers uh, without personally dealing with the individual taxpayer. Uh, would you is are they off base here, or, or are those, are those valid serious concerns? Um, Chairman Lynch, I, I guess first uh, let me address the observation about complexity of the tax code. I, I think for any of us that have uh, looked at all those different volumes, uh, obviously it, it, it could uh, use maybe a little streamlining. I think you've also heard uh, our commissioner uh, talk about the fact that he supports simplification. I do think, uh, you know, as a former enforcement employee myself, uh, we do see situations where the complexity of the tax code does have an obvious effect on people's ability to voluntarily comply. So uh, that's an area we would seek your support as well since, uh, as you know, IRS administers the tax code that uh, Congress passes to us. Uh, the other thing that I, I would say, um, you know, I, I laid out our collection procedures uh, in my written testimony. And we believe that the process we go through from uh, the establishment of the tax delinquency through the first, second, third, fourth notice where we're communicating with the taxpayer and then also giving that taxpayer the opportunity to work with us on a levy uh, if there is a source to levy. You know, we believe that we are uh, following due process and communicating clearly prior to the filing of that lien. Uh, this is an area that we have ongoing discussion with the taxpayer advocate about uh, as well. But the, to the, the question of uh, is it is it a, is it a problem? Uh, you know, I, they I, seem to be saying it's it's your second most serious problem, uh, well, at least I, yeah. from a taxpayer standpoint. That the automatic liens. But, but uh, I, is, I think it, that the, the automated would, lien process the, is the, uh, the point I would make is we have to go through the due process prior to the filing yeah. of the lien. But I just want to let now when you say due process, that's you reviewing your own decisions, right? That that's the collection process where at the time a delinquency or balance due is established, yeah. then we go through established a, by the IRS. Correct. But this is all, you know, I'm a taxpayer. You, 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 you know, tell me I owe X amount of money. I appeal back to you, though. It's not to a third party. You're reviewing your own decision. I still say you're wrong. Right. You say you're right. Well, the, that, that's the appeal process. Yes, so it's not like there's a third party coming in here and saying, okay, here's the IRS over here. I want to be impartial. You're actually reviewing your own decisions and all these, when these notices go, keep going out. There's no, and there's no, neutral third party here that's reviewing this decision. This is not, this is not judicial review. This is you reviewing your own, your, your own situation. And I think that's what they're getting at with the, from the taxpayer advocate's point of view that the, the second most serious problem here is the automatic lien uh, issuance. And that, it just, it gives me great pause when I now see a situation where an employee a federal employee is uh, is going to get a lien, and then also that's going to be that's going to be it for that person. But the, the, just to, to clarify, I mean the the taxpayer, whether a federal employee or a, a private citizen, does have the ability to appeal the lien to you to the Internal Revenue Service right. appeals program. Right, that's what I'm getting at. The first time that they get a uh, you know a third party to look at this is tax court. And under Mr. Chaffetz's scenario, that person would be, federal employee, would be fighting it from the unemployment line. That's, that's my problem with this. I don't think that, that that's a fair opportunity when you're fighting, you know, a tax lien from the unemployment line. And I, I think there's a distinct difference between the, the contractor situation, 
Well, and we have, we have contractors of all sizes. And uh, the problem with trying to address, you know, that situation uh, is, is, is difficult as well. But, you know, for, for the most part, uh, these large contractors and medium-sized contractors, if they don't get a government contract, they are still a contractor with a thousand other opportunities. Uh, the problem, the, the, the comparison here with one federal employee who has one job and gets fired from their one job uh, and now uh, is in the unemployment line, I think that person is, a much, is in a much more uh, vulnerable uh, position. But uh, let me ask you, uh, I have been told we met with the IRS uh, two weeks ago when this issue came up, and we were told that uh, in some cases garnishment uh, works very well uh, with the employees, and there are a lot of people under the 30 that uh, are actually counted as delinquent who are actually in garnishment. Uh, their, their wages are being garnished by, by the IRS. Uh, I'm also told that in conjunction with that, oftentimes the IRS will file a lien just in case that person comes into money, they sell their home, and it protects the position of the taxpayer. So you got garnishment coming out every week, but in the event that that person comes into money or sells their residence and now has liquid assets that you can attach, the lien is in place so that you can, you can grab that money when it becomes available. But under this scenario, if that person was in garnishment and then had the lien put on to protect them, to protect the taxpayer's position, that person would be terminated. And uh, I'm just wondering if, if you think that will will increase our ability to, to recover back taxes from these employees or decrease it? Um, to, to talk about our current process, um, you're, you're absolutely correct in um, your, your information that for federal employees that are in the FERTI program now, that you know, the, the ability to put them on a track to compliance exists in our current system by the, the levy program. So when we have the information that says there's a federal employee that's delinquent, and let me you know, just stress again, we're talking about under 3% of the federal workforce, then because we have a, a good levy source, then we at attach to that. However, if uh, that wage levy will not full pay the account, within the collection statute, you're absolutely correct. I mean, the federal law states that we would then file a lien to protect the government's interest should some, some funds come into play. And I fire the, and we have to fire the employee. So, all right, thank you. I uh, yield five minutes to the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chaffetz. I'll try to frame my, my question here by also noting that there are two places within this piece of legislation that is very specific to the idea and the notion that if they are on a payment plan in a timely manner, and number two, as another opportunity, if they have a debt with respect to which the collection due process, uh, process hearing is requested or pending, that that employee would not be fired. Will the gentleman yield? Sure. Garnishment is not uh, an agreement under the, under the tax code. Uh, nor is it uh, necessarily part of, you don't cover a garnishment in your, your, your bill. I use the exact same language from Bill 572 in H.R. 4735. I do recognize and understand. We wouldn't, that garn we wouldn't garnish a, a contractor. You, That's why it's not the in language I'll, that I'll is being used. The, 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 the language that is being used is... I believe exact. There are obviously differences in, in other parts of the bill. And if there are technical changes that need to happen in, in accordance with that, I have, I'm totally open to it. But to repeatedly state, as if it were fact, that the person would automatically be terminated under this bill, I think is a mischaracterization of what I'm intending to do and of what is literally written in what is a page and a half bill. So my question, which I know I need to get to at some point, uh, has to do with the time that transpires at, through this process. Um, some characterizations at the markup 
were such that the IRS just uh, wakes up one morning, the employee thinks he's good and fine and shows up one day, and next thing you know, not only does he have an IRS problem, but he's also fired from their job. Can you give us, and I recognize the variance in, in, in how wide the cases and situations are, but can you give us a general sense of how much time transpires between the first time this taxpayer knows that they've got some sort of issue with the IRS um, and the final determination as to whether or not that taxpayer is actually delinquent? And I know that's a complicated answer and we have a very short amount of time, but I'd appreciate you yeah, taking a step. Let me, let me see if I can, can lay this out. So once the, the delinquency is established, the, the balance due, then we begin the, the notice process that I, I referenced earlier. So IRS begins a series of four contacts with the taxpayer where we're mailing them the notice saying, here's your balance due, please contact us. We want to work this out, here are your options. From that point in time, from that first notice, you know, time elapses, uh, generally five weeks between the notices where the notices progress to say, please contact us, here's your balance due, we need to talk to you, please work it out with us, all the way through to the fourth notice. The fourth notice is then the point in time where we have exhausted all of the processes and we begin to look for the levy source to begin to do the garnishment. I think it's important to note that a large percentage of taxpayers, whether it's the civilian uh, taxpayer or even a government employee, a large number of folks during that four notice process voluntarily come in before we get to a levy or a lien situation and say, let me work out an installment agreement, which that's exactly how we want the process to work. So that range of time is? Uh, roughly, I would say four and a half to five months of contact with the taxpayer saying, here's your balance due please try to get this worked out with us before we go to the, the levy action. Okay. And at what point can the IRS file a notice of federal tax lien? You know, at the, at the point in time, and I, I'll, I'll give you the simplest scenario, um, when we get to the end of the four notices and we look at the balance due, in the case of the federal workforce, because we do have a levy source, we immediately go to the 15% levy. If that 15% levy will pay off the balance due before the collection statute expires, we let that full pay. However, if that wage levy is not going to full pay before the collection statute, we have a couple of options. We can pull that 15% levy back and go for a full wage levy. We can begin to levy other bank accounts if that's not going to satisfy the obligation, then at that point we could also file a federal tax lien to protect the government's interest. Do, do you know off the top of your head how, how long a period that levy can be in place? Well, you know, I, I think a lot of it's dependent on the amount of the deficiency. Right. And if we can work that out before the collection statute expires. But if we can see readily that it won't, then we would file the lien. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I chair now recognize the gentlelady from the District of Columbia for five minutes. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I just want to uh, note for the record, especially in light of the of ranking member uh, uh, Chaffetz's notion about sauce for the goose and sauce for the gander, uh, about which I uh, would not di uh, differ, that the, the Mr. Chaffetz offered the bill, there were not particular questions raised about the contractor side. It was only when we got to the employee <coughs> side that a flurry of questions began to be raised. I would note also for the record, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Martin, I, I was just need to get some clarification because I'm, I'm not an IRS employee, but I understand that the rule on the IRS for the firing be able for non-tax payment is not for all of the employees of the, of the IRS. It's just for specific employees with, who are at the tax compliance end of it. It's not for managerial supervision or clerical. Uh, actually, that's not true. It applies to all employees, okay. including clerical. It has been applied to grade fours and fives. Okay. So. But it doesn't apply to non-payment. It only applies to willful failure to file or willful understatement of a liability. Okay. I, I'm struck by the 
issue that the chairman raised about hiring. Um, now, as I understand it, the number of, um, uh, I, don't, I don't know how many, but many who wish to be employed are now subjected to uh, credit checks. And of course, a lot of employees, employers do this, where they pull up the credit report. Is that not the case for federal employees, um, Ms. Mr. Morrow, Ms. Ms. Uh, Kelly? Is the credit? I actually, I don't know if it's routine. I think, I know it is done in many cases, but I, I don't know. That would be my answer. I think you'd have to ask the agency. Certainly in situations for law enforcement officers or where suitability or national security certifications are needed, it would be, but for some positions it might not be. OPM might know the answer yes. to that. This is all very uh, <laughs> um, serious uh, because um, all of us can conceive of employees at certain levels doing certain kinds of work where, uh, an abs where you'd want no taint on the employee's record. Ms. Kelly has testified you're a clerk. You're subject to the same uh, sanction, automatic firing, as I suppose somebody until you get to the commissioner who can only be fired for cause uh, 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 through a very, a very specific uh, procedure. Um, um, we also heard testimony that, as it turns out, a very small number have been fired, uh, rather quintessentially small. Does that indicate that the IRS has, uh, in fact, operated with some degree of flexibility, even with respect to its own employees, rather than automatic firing uh, for so-called willful, and that it looks at what is willful and not willful, et cetera? We're trying to find here, I'm trying to find here in this set of questions, uh, I would what say I can about application of this automatic firing uh, that any of you may uh, understand from the way it, it plays out in the field among employees? I would say it's, um, it's two things. And one is the communication and education system that the IRS engages in with employees. I mean, from day one on the job. And then there is annually a reminder of their obligations, uh, of assistance that's available, of um, you know, what it is they need to do if they uh, do not have the money to pay. I mean, it's a, it's a nonstop reminder of their obligation and communication. So my bet is, is there's this much- before, you know, if a lien occurs, for example, there's great discussion in this committee about what can occur anywhere when there's a lien, that's it. Uh, many employers, and I still am not clear, uh, particularly for the IRS, if a lien showed up, whether that would be automatically trigger a firing by the IRS or whether, in fact, the lien could result in some of the procedures you have outlined, for example, Ms. Kelly. Well, in the, um, if a lien were filed on an IRS employee, they would be looked at very, very closely to determine why. And then in the end, they would get down to this willful question. Uh, first and foremost, what they want and should want is every employee to be in compliance to you know, be current in their tax filings and in their tax payments or to be on some kind of a payment plan. If they were in a lien situation, um, that could raise a series of questions about failure to pay. And it really would depend on the specifics of the situation. Um, and the IRS looks at them, they take them very seriously and they look at them very closely. And I would not attribute the low number of firings that um, uh, seemed, you know, that were reported, uh, that everyone has categorized as low, that Ms. Tucker reported, as meaning that the IRS doesn't take this seriously. It's, uh, they focus on the willful because that's what 1203 says. But as I said, before there was ever 1203, the IRS dealt with these issues as, as they always should. I mean, they took it seriously and uh, they had raised the bar. It was a much higher standard. Um, and so no, in I'm a lot of ways, 1203 really got in the way of them doing what mm -hmm. they were trying to do because they were exercising judgment on the specific circumstances in a case, which I think is what we would all agree should happen. The, the standards were intentionally set quite high in Section 1203 
to um, require termination, since that was the only sanction permitted under the provision, only in egregious cases. So that it requires a final determination. It requires that the conduct be willful, and it requires that it not be due to reasonable cause or, or uh, neglect. Those are all terms of art within the tax law that the tax employees of the IRS would clearly understand. But I would add that there have been problems with it because willful, what you see as willful can be different than what I see as willful. And it is uh, then the, the commissioner's decision, and only the commissioner can make the decision um, to not terminate under Section 1203 based on the willful determination. So it, it, it is not a, um, you know, a test that is pure and that everyone agrees on in every case. So you, you wouldn't say that the IRS has, has uh, unfairly, particularly given its opposition in the first place, uh, to, uh, to the um, 1980, new, 1980, new 1998 procedure. You, you wouldn't say that they had unfairly applied it. I would say they worked very hard to put a new process in place, which they had to do. They had to create this panel to make recommendations to the commissioner, and they worked very hard to put a fair process in place. That being said, there have still been a number of situations where we disagree that it was willful. Um, but I, I would say, in general, they have worked very hard to put a fair process in place to apply 1203, yes. Well, one of the issues, and uh, Chairman Lynch raised this uh, until we had to have this hearing, frankly, about the effect of the lien, because he raises as a lawyer knowing full well that lien is a lien, and you can have steps. Um, before you decide to enforce a lien, but you could enforce it once that lien is is there. And from from your testimony, given willful and the rest of it, I gather that even at the at the uh, IRS, the lien, uh, despite its protection of the United States, if it chooses to use it does not automatically trigger uh, tribute I see a lien your your job is gone that's even at the IRS much less I suppose other elsewhere at the IRS lien shows up um, I've not had the opportunity to say anything about it but it's on the books if I worked for almost anybody they had a piece of paper which they could enforce I wonder if it is the testimony of all of you that even at the IRS, uh, uh, yes, the IRS, uh, one would have to look and see, look at things like willful, et cetera. It, it is certainly the case that the mere filing of a federal tax lien against an IRS employee is not grounds for termination under Section 1203. If, however, the, the lien has arisen because of willful failure to file. They didn't file a return at all. But see, you know, may not know. the employee may not have had the opportunity uh, to address willfulness. Well, the they would always know whether they had filed or not. Yes, by that point. Okay. So if a, if a federal tax lien arises because the IRS prepares a substitute return and files a federal tax lien pursuant to that, the taxpayer has plenty of notice about that. Uh, of course. Now, that doesn't, con that doesn't presume that they willfully fail to fire. They would, of course, have to do an investigation of the sort Ms. Kelly described. Yeah. In, in application, um, it does not appear that the IRS would simply jump on the lien, uh, although that's far along in the process. You know, I, I, I was going to suggest, actually, you might want to pose this question to the IRS. I try to get it from Ms. <laughs> <laughs> she seemed to step away from. Uh, automatic uh, firing, you know, by looking at willfulness and the rest of it. Right. And I'm trying to find out in practice, uh, since the lien troubled many of us because of its legal effect and its immediate legal effect if uh, the entity is old, choose to pursue it, we were concerned with particularly going <laughs> to other federal employees as to whether or not right. Uh, the government would say, I got a lien, I haven't got, I got a lot of work. I know if I uh, try to enforce, maybe I'll get the attention. Uh, the IRS could do that. Well, and and my question is, would it really do that, especially in light of the fact they didn't even think that this process uh, was necessary? 
in order for it to get compliance with its own employees? Well, the employee tax compliance program that was in place even before 1203 and that continues today um, would have, when those notices are sent, the four notices that they talked about saying that you're delinquent, at some point, and this is probably what the IRS needs to answer because I'm not sure, as to where, at what point in the four notices, um, and then the levy, and then the lien, is the manager given the information and told to deal with the employee, to let the employee know that, you know, this is, because I can tell you, I do not think the IRS would move slowly if they had information that an IRS employee had a lien filed against them. I think the manager would be calling that employee into their office uh, yesterday. Um, so, but, I, but I, I don't know exactly at what point. The manager at some point gets involved. And uh, that could be a question for the IRS because I don't think they would ever be surprised that a lien was coming to an IRS employee because they follow it really closely through this employee tax compliance program. And so all this reference, so the IRS knows probably well in advance of a lien and that they're, they're trying to counsel with the employee ahead of time. Yes. Now imagine that <laughs> happening across the entire government and the annuitants. <laughs> we're going to counsel you, we're going to deal with you. Um, uh, so we, we have serious concerns about how practical any of this is. I have a, uh, a question. Uh, this is from the testimony of Mr. Rosano. Um, you indicate near the end of your testimony an expansion of authority to garnish wages should be considered. I take it as an alternative to looking at uh, at uh, the lien what process. the bill proposes, and yes. uh, and why why would it why would a an expansion be necessary? Personally, we don't think an expansion would be necessary because there, the provisions of the law are already there. But if in fact, in order to be able to get around this legislation, if in fact additional IRS rules, laws, or regulations could be implemented, that would help the federal employer, all American taxpayers, to be able to to resolve their issues a little bit more judiciously. Mr. Norton, I'd just like to say one thing. Before we came into this room today, I had a, one of our members came up to me, and she was a single parent. And a few years back, she had a difficult situation, and she had to make she negotiated with the IRS a payment plan. What happened was the IRS failed to process the payment plan, the payment book to her, and she never got it. She ended up getting a lien applied against her. If this law was, in fact, if this uh, legislative action was in fact law, she would have had to been fired. And that's what we're really against. If she had worked for the IRS, did she work if for the If she worked for any, any federal agency. Well, well I, no, this automatic firing is IRS employees. No, I said if that legislation is passed as written. All right, all right. Um, <laughs> let, let's let me say to you some of the practical realities of enforcement have come out only in this hearing. These were, were hardly raised when members uh, at the markup began to raise some of the obvious legal questions. I have another question uh, for which I think we would need um, far greater information before proceeding on this bill. There is some very scary and bad figure cited about the billions of dollars owed by federal employees. I don't know what in the world that means. Owed when? Cured, subject to um, uh, um, uh, subject to um, an employee, subject to contesting. Um, I, I, I owed at what point in time? I, you know, no one has, has has indicated what that means. Does that really mean that that people are carrying around years of federal liability? while drawing a paycheck from the federal government, Mr. Isaac? Yes, it does. It means that the tax liability has been assessed, which is a formal act entering the liability on the books in the United States and making the taxpayer liable for it. Taxpayer has an opportunity to contest it both before that and after that. But if it's assessed and not paid, it's carried in that account. The operative word, Mr. Rizek, is not paid. For example, uh, I suppose the example you've just given, Mr. Obisano, she is owed that amount until, until it's paid. Until it's paid, it's stated as owed. I don't know if in calculating these billions of dollars owed, 
every month they look and see how much of it's been paid. They look at when the liability was assessed and these employees owed it. Now they've worked out a payment plan and I don't have any reason to believe that somebody is take, keeping track of how much they paid down until they finally don't have any tax liability. Ms. Kelly? Yeah, I, I think you're right on the mark with that. And again, I would, at the risk of suggesting questions you ask the IRS, I, I'm going to do that again because, but this is the way I understand this. They take this snapshot on September 30th each year of the, of the dollars owed. Um, so that it's a moving target, for sure it changes. But on September 30th, that's the money owed. But included in there, if I were to owe $2,000 and I am on a 15% um, levy of my wages, uh, I owe $2,000 on uh, September 30th. That $2,000 is in there, even though they're taking out 15% every pay period. So the next September 30th, whatever they took out of my pay, it would be decreased the amount owed. But I am paying that amount, but it is included in the billions that you're citing. So it, you know, you could look at it at first blush and say it's owed and nobody is doing anything about paying. And that is not the case because everyone who's on a 15% uh, garnishment of their wages, those dollars are still in there or being carried as due. So, but again, the IRS would really be the ones to clarify that, but that is how I understand it. And a question like that has to be submitted for the record. You know, when do you, at what point do you assess? And I, if anything, they probably just add on. Well, the next <laughs> you September add on to 30th, the next year what you had last year. The next September 30th, anyone knew would be added, and then any money that was withheld from my garnishment would come out. That would come out if that it was garnished. That would come out mm -hmm. because it's not owed anymore, mm -hmm. but the 1700 I still owe is still there. Yeah. It was 2000 here, and it's seven. yes. Um, Perhaps there is a distinction between IRS employees and, and others, and I'm not sure, especially since the IRS opposed uh, the very, proce the very processes that has served as a pilot program for what some now w want to do to every federal employee and annuitant. Uh, uh, given the fact that neither this administration nor the last administration felt, has felt that, that the fair and reasonable thing to do uh, is to apply such a process. Uh, I have my serious doubts about why anybody would want to proceed after what we've, we've learned today. And the reason I have doubts is because of what, how I think every, every hearing should be structured. Uh, it's the obligation of an agency head to come and defend the agency's practices. You have learned nothing about the, urgent, the, the agency's practices until uh, as I say to uh, my own staff on, on uh, the committee I chair, until you've heard from some real people. <laughs> uh, you represent the real people who at, would be at the other end of the spread of the IRS procedure across the government. I do not speak for any other member of this committee, but speaking for myself, uh, having heard realistically how this would apply, now knowing that uh, uh, looking at two administrations who don't share much in common, neither believe uh, that the present policy at the IRS should be in effect, I do not see, uh, given your testimony, uh, given what appear to be the thoughtful deliberations of two very different administrations, why this subcommittee, in the face of the most expert uh, testimony we can find, would proceed to spread a bad practice across the federal workforce. I know I speak on behalf of the chairman when I say at least this much. We have benefited tremendously from your testimony, and we greatly appreciate your coming to testify before us today. The hearing is adjourned.